From the earliest known time in history, information was passed on singularly. The song was repeated from one person to the next, or a single book copied by hand. In 1440, a man by the name of Gutenberg invented printing from movable type. A faster way of disseminating information had come about, because a page could now be set in type and multiple copies printed. It proved to be one of history's most important events, and it is here that our story really begins. For hundreds of years following Gutenberg, the availability of information expanded gradually. Though multiple copies of books did exist, they had to be carried from one place to another. So the expansion was primarily limited by the ability to move about. But in 1836, the control of electricity led to the invention and development of the telegraph. Suddenly, the spread of information was no longer limited by how fast a person could travel. Almost instantly, a message could be transmitted from one city to another, hundreds of miles away. The invention of new information media followed rapidly. Telephone, photographs, wireless radio, movies, sound recording, television, speedier printing, computers, satellites, the list goes on and on. An incredible array of devices that bombard us with sounds and images. With each new invention, the amount of available information grew. The rapid expansion had become an information explosion. The information explosion has not only fostered great changes in our way of life, it has helped to accelerate the rate at which those changes occur. The result is many positive benefits and new and exciting possibilities, but also sociological and even psychological problems. This film, then, is about the sources and the technologies of the information explosion, some of its effects and some individual responses to it. The modern technologies of typesetting and printing would have stunned Gutenberg. As opposed to the gathering of metal letters one by one, type can be set today by computer-driven photographic typesetting equipment, working at speeds of up to hundreds of words per second. The development of color printing, especially the printing of photographs in magazines and books, has also been a major component of the information explosion. By printing from continuous rolls of paper, the modern web presses like those which print magazines or newspapers, are capable of turning out enormous quantities of printed matter. The New York Times alone publishes 74 million words per year, or about two average length books per day, and that's just one newspaper. In the United States, over 30,000 new books are published each year. Imagine it, 30,000 different titles. From the early experiments by Alexander Graham Bell, a vast telephone network has grown which crisscrosses our cities and extends around the world. Today, we can pick up the phones in our homes and talk to others on the next block or in the next country. Good morning. I have a collect call from Mr. Burns. Will you accept the charge? Thank you. Go ahead. It is from long-distance switching centers like this that the flow of calls is controlled and monitored as the calls go out by cable or by microwave transmission to points around the world. New information is being instantly and continuously gathered, processed and disseminated. And through the use of television, computers, data processing equipment, and broadcasting techniques, all forms of information, oral, written, photographic, whether on paper, film, or TV, can be processed, stored, or transmitted anywhere in the world in less than a fifteenth of a second. In other words, almost instantly. Not only is the speed with which information is disseminated astronomical, so is the technology for gathering. Communication satellites, minicams, transcontinental telephones, and a myriad of other electronic devices have accelerated the gathering of information as well. Television is one of the main components of the information explosion. There are over 100 million television sets in America, at least one in 99% of the homes. Perhaps nowhere is the process of both gathering and dissemination more relevant to our individual lives than in the operation of a major TV news department. For most people in America, the TV news is the main source of information about the world. 
Scarcely an hour had passed from the time of the closing of the polls when Dennis Block appeared at his loop headquarters to concede. Candidates rise and fall by the image they portray on TV, and some have tried to manipulate the news, for they realize its tremendous influence on our lives. It's just too overwhelming today, uh, mainly because of the low turnout. There's a built-in vote that they have. I'm not making any excuses. I lost. He beat me fair and square. But this is the building effort, and we got a great ticket going in 78, and I'm sure that you'll see a great change in the city of Chicago and county at that time. Although I'm the news director here at the station, the news actually directs itself. We get information from newspapers, wire services, hundreds of public relations people, uh, books that we read, magazines that we read, sources that we talk to, uh, the Associated Press Wire, the United Press Wire, the City News Wire, the State Wire. Picking out and sorting out among all those inputs every day is what the, is the job of the people who work here. And they, they thumb through those and look through those and they try to decide what's most important and what's most significant and what's most interesting. We can't present reality as it actually is because we'd have to be on 24 hours a day with 15 or 20 or 30 different channels just to get all the information that's available to us. So we have to edit it down and create a view and present actually a view of the world that's as close to reality in the short amount of time we have as possible. I think objectivity is a myth. A myth that uh, people in the news business have been trying to perpetuate now since the time the news business began. I think we better, at one point, get down to the reality of the situation, which is that no reporter, if any human being, can ever be totally, completely objective about something. We all bring our personal prejudices to stories that we cover, and the explosion has caused so many different stories to be so available to us in so many different ways that we can't be thoroughly backgrounded and experienced on every kind of story that we cover. We have to find a way to differentiate between what is news and what is not. That's a very difficult assignment because anything can be news to me, to you, to an another person, to the assignment desk, to the producer, to the anchorman. Whatever, whatever seems to be news to someone doesn't necessarily mean that it's news to someone else. If something happens, we can be there in an instant, literally, in an instant, if it's right around the corner, in minutes, if it's halfway down, uh, down the block. And we can bring to the viewer live something that is actually happening. And the viewer can make up his own mind, draw his own conclusions, get his own information in his own way by just watching it all unravel right before his eyes. That impact is indescribable. Walter Jacobson, John Coughlin, Johnny Morris, Channel 2, the 10 o'clock news. Our top story of the night began 10 days ago when gunshots rocked Humboldt Park and violence ripped the surrounding community. Today, a police report concludes that a police officer fired the shot that triggered the outbreak, killing at least one of the two victims of that June 4th disturbance on Puerto Rican Independence Day. Today, the parents took to the picket lines, adding their voices to the protest over desegregation. But protests went beyond the schools. Many parents said that the changing racial makeup of the schools would trigger changes in the neighborhoods as well. Tickets also spread today to two other schools in the same neighborhood, the Hubbard High School and the Dawes Elementary School. Coming up, we'll find out that the stork has fallen upon hard times and we'll get some good times weather from Irene Rodriguez. Two. Uh, Ready to roll the salve? Silent. Ready to super down. Great. Hey, oh, yeah. Yeah. Losing. Last night, the Twins lost to yeah. California. Yeah. 12 to 9. Ready? The White Sox dropped the game to Boston. Rolled his out. Super out. George runs 40. Long shots to tie the game at 1-1. One, one. Three. Seven, but, <laughs> well, he's got the advantage over those other skin divers because it doesn't have to go for You can swing one. Take two. The information explosion has had a profound influence on the changing American lifestyle. It has brought great changes in our way of life and has increased the rate of speed at which that lifestyle changes. So bound up in it are we that it is often hard to measure all the ways we are affected. The expansion of information media has a profit, and that profit is Marshall McLuhan. 
McLuhan has said that the medium is the message. That is, it is the means by which society communicates that determines how society thinks and how it will change. It is not what you see on television, according to McLuhan, but the very fact of television that is significant. It is certainly safe, however, to say that we are becoming more rapidly influenced by ideas, events, and styles from around the world. Imagine, for instance, that it took the waltz nearly three decades to catch on in the late 19th century, but now a popular new dance or hairstyle or clothing fad can spread in just a few weeks and become obsolete just as fast. In ancient times, a classroom may have consisted of a scholar and a few disciples gathered around. With the advent of printing, each student now had a book from which to learn. The book was the first learning machine. But imagine the modern classroom today with learning kits, games, film strips, films, and television to show you what is happening all over the world. The information explosion has revolutionized and accelerated the learning process right in the schools. And if you don't find what you need in the classroom, there is a library filled with thousands of books and magazines. And that's not only true in school, but in every profession as well. Technological developments have also enabled each of us to become part of the sending process. The CB radio, for instance, has created a vast information network without any central studio. Okay, maybe after they're through, I'll take a look at some of the slides you can see how they look to you. Well, they made a change in our graphic station too, Dorothy. They, as far as the frame, other systems are growing you know, all the time. Under, underneath in one large company with offices yeah. around the U.S., and, uh, executives uh, can carry on face-to-face -face conferences with each other without ever leaving their buildings. The signals are carried via long-distance phone lines. And in the Rocky Mountains, many schools in remote areas are connected to each other via a television network with signals bounced off communication satellites. Talk with Blanding, Utah and Buzzing, Montana, if we can. Again, direct two-way television without any central studio. Modern technology has enabled us to instantly communicate with each other around the world. The Earth has become a global village and all of us neighbors. We are bombarded by information about everyone and everything. Knowledge is supposed to be power, but is too much information producing a feeling of powerlessness and anxiety? Are there simply too many choices? We are constantly being bombarded with information of all kinds, particularly nowadays, particularly in modern times. That probably is one of the major characteristics of of modern times, the availability of information. We, we, are, we must somehow deal with all this information. There is information that we get of which we're not even conscious, but somehow or another we have to deal with the information. One of the major devices that is available to us to deal with the information is a process called selective inattention, which is mediated by the brainstem or by the reticular activating system in the brainstem. This device, this mechanism, allows us to assign weight to the information in a discriminating way. Why can a mother sleep through a, sun, a thunderstorm but awaken at the slightest whimper of her baby? The reason she can do that is because she can selectively inattend. That device allows her to go on sleeping, and it's a very protective device. She can assign weight, even while asleep, to information so that she can discriminate between uh, the various kinds of information and make, make choices as to what, what information is important and what information is not. If we're not able to selectively attend, we disintegrate. We, simple, we simply can't handle all that information. We become disorganized, our anxiety level goes up, and we become psychotic, possibly schizophrenic. That may be the mechanism of schizophrenia, a failure of selective inattention. We are all exposed, in one way or another, to an ever-increasing quantity of information. And the communications media have allowed almost all of us, like it or not, to achieve a kind of global consciousness. The question is, can we deal with it? How will it affect us? Will we become so bombarded by information, so over-fatigued by the media, that we become numb and insensitive to even suffering and disaster? 
Or will we become more tolerant and understanding, more concerned with the problems of the billions of others who share our global village?